of pink and a blue table are closed. All the tables are closed on a silent auction. If you haven't gone and claimed your, uh, your bid, I would appreciate it if you go take care of that now. And now, folks, hello. You're going to want to hear this. This is very important. Please. Give me two minutes of your time. I know there's a lot of older married couples in here and younger married couples in here, but you're going to need this information. This friend of mine, 35 years they were married, they were having marital problems. So they go to a counselor and they go in and sit down. The counselor says, well, what seems to be the problem? Well, the woman gets up and she starts ramping and raving and ranting and telling how inconsiderate and how unkind and lazy, infidelity, loneliness. And she kept going and going. And finally, uh, he stands up, he walks over, he embraces her, he puts about a 30 second whopper of a kiss on her, lets her go. She finally steps back, he walks back around, sits down in his chair and he says to her husband, now, that's exactly what this woman needs three times a week. Can you handle that? He stopped for a minute, he said, well, he said, I can bring her to you on Monday and Wednesday, but Friday I fish. <laughs> A lot of people know I hunt a lot and fish, and my wife likes tea. She does tea, so she allows me to hunt. I allow her to go to tea. Well, I've been married for 45 years, and we go to these seminars, and um, one of the persons at the seminar asked us, what do we accredit 45 years of marriage? I said, well, after 25 years, I took my wife to London, England for tea. They said, wow, that's really awesome. But what about the other 20 years? I said, oh, last year I went back and got her. <laughs> it works, guys, it works. Okay, right now, we've got a guest speaker with us tonight. His name is Russ. Russ, Russ Gable, he's the founder and director of Free Water Experiences, as you've seen out there. It's a nonprofit outdoor ministry committed to reaching teens with the hope of Jesus Christ through fishing, camping, and other outdoor experiences. He also does a ton of speaking engagements, which is what brings him here tonight. I'm telling you folks, you need to listen to him. I heard him last night. He does a lot of the job. Here's Russ. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, everyone take a deep breath. Settle back in your seat after. 38 courses of dinner. Oh my goodness. I was I was at a friend's house, Jimmy Gretzinger. How many of you guys know Jimmy Gretzinger? Moved to Grand Haven, greatest thing that happened to Grand Haven in my outdoor ministry. He's been a great help to me. And uh, he is my connection that ended up um, connecting me with this event. And I'm at his house on Wednesday and I said, What can you tell me about this uh, church in war? And he says, Here's what I can tell you. So with a meal, you have to pace yourself. He said, Because you're going to think when the meatball comes, you're going to want to. No, no. Half. He says when the when the when the next thing comes to chili, he says they're gonna they're gonna serve you several main courses. You're gonna think you're done, and it's it's never done. It goes on and on. It was awesome. Was food awesome, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for the kitchen and the youth group kids who are helping serve. Awesome. We hope you guys earn a ton of money for your trip to Colorado this summer. So, um, my name is Russ Gate. We're gonna flip that first slide. Somebody's gonna flip that first slide. The guy who's supposed to, who's running on it right now, and he said, and I'm gonna tell you real quick. Um, I've been a youth pastor for 17 years doing retreat speaking for youth group kids and uh, conference centers and things like that. And after 17 years, I took a break from church ministry and I decided that I wanted to uh, look into outdoor ministry. My heart and passion has been hunting and fishing and I saw a ton of kids that weren't coming into my youth group, but they love the same activities that I did. So after 17 years, I totally broke away from the church setting and I went after those kids. I found a ministry called Free Water Experience. Basically, we set up hunting, fishing, and camping experiences for teens who are not engaged in youth groups to give them the awesome experiences, great mentoring, and share my faith with them. Soon we're going to be launching some weekly meetings and tying in other outdoor activities like rock climbing, mountain biking, disc golf. You know what? Whatever kids are doing outside, I want to do that with them so I can share my faith. And that's what that's what free water experience is all about. And it has given me some amazing opportunities. Some of the craziest things I did in the past year. Any sucker spearers in here? Usually there's one or two guys who have like heavy gray hair and remember the old days. We still do that and it is the craziest, funnest thing 
The second funnest thing I did last year. Walking around at night, headlamp, giant spear, stabbing, splashing, laughing, it's awesome. The second one, and actually this is the craziest thing I did last year, was the Redneck Fishing Tournament. Anyone know what that is? That's the Asian carp thing in Bath, Illinois, where you drive your boat next to boats with like Elvis impersonators, and there's Canadian Mounties in that boat, and there's the Spartans in this one with their spears yelling, and it's just, it's two days of pandemonium, mayhem, flying fishing. I'm telling you, I watched those things come out of the water and knock people over. And I have video of guys with like giant black eyes and busted noses, and my boat, I had 400 Asian carp in and out of my boat that weekend, and it looked like a glazed donut. It was like fish slime, scales, blood. It was just three hours of power washing is what it was. It was awesome. But just a ton of great experiences. And one of those, are there any late season goose hunters in here? I know I saw one. Okay, so most of you are in your right mind. Okay, because late, late goose season is this. It's walking in like a swamp that's frozen in snow in waders with like frozen sweaty hair and like boogers in your mustache frozen like a little rock. And, and it's just, it's the most miserable thing. And you know, they're all, they're all on the golf course. They're not in my swamp, they're on the golf course. And they won't let me hunt there because I have boogers in my nose. I look like a crazy man out in the snow. Well, I posted some pictures of goose hunting on Facebook and one of my friends in Florida said, you look positively miserable, check your inbox. If it's for me, tell them I'm not available right now. Um, and, uh, and he said, check your inbox. And I checked and there was a uh, confirmation number. And he said, you're coming down to Naples with me. I went, really? He said, I want to bless you. I'm like, oh, I feel blessed. Bless me, man. That's awesome. So he brought me down for a week and he said, here's, here's the trade. I will let you fish and I will have a surprise at the end of the trip. But I am training for triathlons and you have to train with me each day. Oh. I said, no problem. <laughs> I'm, I'm fit, <laughs> I'll run, whatever, and that was, that was a colossal mistake, but uh, we did some fishing, we did snook fishing at night in the intercoastals, casting a pier lights to catch snook, that was awesome, and we did some biking, some swimming, mercifully no running, and then at the end of the week he says, I have a surprise for you, you can flip slides now, he says, you're going on a hog hunt, I said, what, he says, a hog hunt, he said it just like that. He says, I'm going to get you all set up. We're heading out to a farm right now and you're good to go. I show up at the farm with them. They put me in camouflage and they hand me a shotgun filled up with buckshot. And they said, this is, this is the hog stopper. I said, yes it is. He said, we're going to put you in a stand in a cypress swamp and we're going to let you go to work. I said, and work I will. Put me in that stand. And they took me out there. They marched me out. I got up in my tree stand and I'm just taking it in. I'm like, it's February, now then I'm in a tree stand, it's 65 degrees. My Michigan buddies have boogers frozen to their mustache, and I'm, my boogers are fully thawed right now. It's awesome, and I'm just taking in the sights and sounds, and a few hours pass, and I'm just like, man, I'm in a swamp in Florida, that's so cool. And then it's starting to get dark, and I'm like, wow, I'm, uh, I'm in a swamp in Florida. It's kind of starting to get dark. You know, we don't, we don't get scared out there, do we guys? No, no. Well, I'm starting to get a little like, whoa, I'm, this is kind of weird. Maybe I should be heading back. And then I hear a noise that in the entire life as a Michigan hunter, I have never heard in the woods. And it goes like this. check myself, my heart starts pounding, I'm like, it's out in the field. So I'm climbing down my stand and I'm sneaking out and it's starting to really get dark. And I'm going out into this farmer's field and there's bushes and trees and shrubs around, it's not just wide open. And I'm remembering what the farmer told me. When you come back, if you see something, make sure it's not a cow before you shoot it. <laughs> this seems like, all right, I should, I should know. But it's getting dark, and some of the pigs are big and some of the cows are small, so their sizes are close. And I, I see shapes ahead of me, three of them. And I'm, I creep up within 40 yards, and I'm just like, I can't tell. And I'm watching, and, and then they move, and here's what I see. I see a body that kind of glides, and the feet go, and I go, that's not a cow. Cows kind of lumber. 
pigs hover like the Jetsons space car. That's what they do, and their little legs go And I went, pig. And I, yeah, I lift the gun up, and I'm like, all right, it's time to make some magic. 40 yards, buckshot, side shot at a pig, here we go. He looks right at me, I'm like, pig. <laughs> Bam! And I, I mean, it's dark enough, I see flame come out the end of the gun, and the pig goes, and takes off running, and then out of the bushes, 20 yards away, the most horrifying, stampeding, thundering, squealing, 40 pigs are in that bush. I did not even know they were there. And they go busting out, and they're like, ah! And my pigs run in, and stampede's going this way, and I'm like, ch -ch -ch ah! And I go running after them. And now I'm chasing the hogs, man. There's like 40, I can see it, and they're just a mob of pigs running for dear life, and I am chasing them. I am running with the hogs. <laughs> Those guys in Spain with the bulls got nothing on me. And I'm getting close, I'm 20 yards away, and I can see some of them are as tall as my thigh. And, and I don't think, what if they all just stopped and turned around? Like, I don't, that thought is not allowed in. I'm just chasing them. I'm, I'm gonna make bacon, man. I get 20 yards away, I see they're darting under the fence, and I go, here it goes, stop and swing it. All I can see is pig butts. And that's where the ethical hunter in me comes in, you can't shoot the pig butt, that's the best part. You don't have to shot your bacon one up. And they all got away, and, that, and then we didn't, I missed the one that I shot at. Isn't that a great story? How many of you guys have funny stories like that that end in nothing? That's right. It would be so easy to come up here and talk about all our successes, wouldn't it? You guys have all kinds of hunting successes, all the antlers and pictures and stuff, and you love to tell those stories. Ladies, do they love to tell those stories? Of course they do. But what about our failures? Anyone have epic fails in the outdoors? I want to see hands. I want to know I'm not alone in this room. That's right, be vulnerable. Today, guys, we're going to bear our souls. We're going to open up that little masculine heart. We're going to pour it out in our failures. Fall 07, I decided I was going to be, I was going to work on my house. I had to put some bedrooms in the basement, do some finishing up. October 1 hits, I have not scouted, hung a stand, or done anything. Normally I'm doing that in June, but to get it all done, I haven't done a thing. October 15 comes, I'm still part way into this job. Now November 1st hits and I'm getting close to finish and I'm like, wow, my bow season's almost done. And I might as well just walk out in the woods with my pants around my ankles. I have no prep, I have no, I'm, I, have no I, I got no chance. And one of my friends said, well, you can come on my property. I've got 20 acres. I said, dude, you have a deer processing barn. Every deer in the county knows not to come on your property, I'm sure. He's got like piles of hides and like carcasses hanging inside. I'm like, fine, I'll, sure, whatever, I'll do it. On a Saturday afternoon, I climb up into my stand and I'm sitting up there and after a while, I'm kind of lacking motivation. I'm really not having high expectations and I begin to do the hunter's nod. Do you do the hunter's nod? <laughs> Anyone ever fall asleep in their stand? They have to stop making them so comfortable, really. I have literally woken up in my tree stand with my butt on the edge of my seat and all my weight hanging off the front, leaning against my strap and go, ah! <laughs> Sit back, <laughs> shaking. I'm doing my nod, and at some point my eyes are closed, my bow is laying across my lap, I'm not clipped, my, my release isn't even clipped to the string, and I hear a footstep right underneath me. And I look down and all I see is antlers. Now up to this point I have not shot any buck worth bragging about. I've shot bucks that are like, woo, four point. You know, I've never shot, I've never even seen anything worth like shooting that was braggable. And all I see is antlers, and I think it's a six or something, I'm like, oh! And it's not, I mean, I'm just, my heart's racing. Pounding, pounding hand, shaking, bow, laying across my lap in perfect prepared position. And he's right underneath me, and I'm just trying so hard not to just like freak out. And he's he takes about ten steps, and now he's ten yards out, almost directly underneath me. And I'm and I get I get my release clipped, and I'm like, wait a minute, I got a chance. And I kind of twist, and I kind of draw, and I go, wow, I've never ever shot a bow in this position before. And I, I'm like, all right, I'm already planning like back straps, stakes. Butt, stakes, shoulder, jerky. And then I go, and the bow hits the bottom of my stand and kicks down. And this deer jumps six feet up in the air. And I, I still think I hit it, of course. And that year, I, at that time, I started practicing that march of that year. I shoveled a trail out to my, out to my target through the snow so I could start practicing. Practice 15 to 20 arrows every single day. 
I could shoot the bottle cap on a two liter bottle at 20 yards. That was what I would do to sh kind of impress my kids and stuff and their friends. So I'm like, you're dead, that's it. 10 yards, I'm already planning the food and meals and stuff. The deer jumps up and I still think I hit him and he runs off 40 yards and he stops. And I'm like, yes, I am gonna watch. I sick of seeing those guys on the show, they shoot the deer and it just drops dead. Mine never do that. I go track them for four hours, go to bed, stare at the ceiling all night, track them the next morning and never find them. That's my honey. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm gonna watch that deer die. And I'm, I'm just staring, die deer, die. And he, he's standing there and then a doe comes over and they start sniffing. I said, okay, I'm gonna watch this deer slowly bleed out. And they're pacing around and then he starts walking off. I'm like, I'm gonna have a really easy tracking job. I don't know. And I climb down and I look at the arrow, no fur, no blood, miss him completely. And my, I'm just broken. I mean, I'm like, I wanna throw up. You ever had that feeling? I just want to puke. I want to take my bow and just slam it against the tree, throw it in the woods, and go home. I climb back up in my stand and I sit down and I'm just like, hunting is stupid. This sucks. I'm terrible. <laughs> and I'm totally, my mind has wandered and I just footsteps underneath me again. And I look down and it's the wimpiest little four point. I went, unless, he, unless he's wearing a dog collar, I'm shooting him. <laughs> you're dead. You're brown and you're down. <laughs> He's good. I get my bow ready. He's just like, uh, little stupid young buck, doesn't know anybody. He's like, apples? I smell apples. You know. I get my bow ready. He stops and turns 20 yards. I'm thinking, bottle cap. This deer's dead. Draw my bow. I release. And I counted it for everything except for the branch, 10 yards between us. And I watch my arrow go, and missed his back by about six inches. He goes prancing off in the woods, and now I want to die. <laughs> you ever have failures? My hunting and fishing life is checkered with them. Broken lines, broken rods, missed, oh, netting fish at the boat, always missing them. Missed shots, spooked deer. That's my hunting world. I want to get up in here and say, I'm a pro excellent. I'm an expert at screwing it up <laughs> and failing. You know what? And that's hunting world, isn't it? You know what? And that's life, isn't it? I start to wrestle with how do I process failure in hunting and fishing, but it's really how do I process failure in life? Because there are a lot of places we can feel like we fail. We can feel like we fail as a husband or a wife. We can feel like we fail as a parent, as a business person, as a student. And how do we work through that failure? That's really where I'm going. I bet you couldn't figure out where this is going and now it's going to go, zeek, makes sense. Okay? It's not about wild pigs and stuff. What well, kind of is? I want to talk about three reasons I think God allows us to experience failure and what we can get out of it. I think one reason, I haven't been advancing you right, go one more. Sometimes I lose my focus. I think one reason God allows us to experience failure is because we can learn from our failures. I was driving in my car with my son, who's six now, he was three at the time. His first hunting experience, we're driving past a property, I have permission to hunt, I look and there's turkeys in their yard. I went, I have missed six turkeys with my bow. I can't tell you the agony. I don't know what happens in my brain, but when it's got feathers and it's walking on the ground, I can't get it. And I'm like, it's go time. I'm like, Connor, you want to do this? He's like, do it, Daddy. I'm like, come on, yeah. Little three-year-old boy, let's do this. We go in the back of the car. I put my extra large leafy camo thing on him. It's dragging on the ground. He looks like an Ewok from Star Wars. I can hardly even see his face. I put on some camo pants. Got some subdued little, you know, earth tone shirt that I'm wearing is good enough. I get my bow, we stalk around behind a barn, I peek around the corner, 15 yards away. Yes. I draw my bow, I peek out, they're still there, not even looking at me. I start to ease out and I hear a branch snap behind me. And I look, the turkeys both look and they tear off down the trail. I'm like, dang it! I look and my son is looking at his foot. And I go, <clears throat> what happened? And he looks up at me and he goes, I step on a stick. <laughs> and I went, what do you think? No, I didn't. I went, <sighs> it's okay, son. Daddy stepped on a lot of sticks too. <laughs> and he's walking away and then I'm like, <laughs> all right. I tease him about that a lot because he's not going to step on a stick next time. I'm saying, hey, what happened to those turkeys, buddy? He goes, daddy, I know. <laughs> I'm telling him that story tonight, by the way, buddy. 
So he knows. Think about when you fail. Well, think about when you succeed. When you succeed, when you get that buck, you land that fish, or in life, those big successes, what do you really learn from those? You relied on what you know, and it worked. So instead of really learning anything, we get this elated of ego, we're the man, you get all inflated about it, you brag about it, but did you really learn anything? Not really, you just experienced success. When we fail, have you spent that night staring at the ceiling going, oh, what happened? And you're playing it through your mind again and again, whether it's fishing, hunting, your life, what the heck happened there? And you play it over and over and you go, oh, if I could only do it again, I'd do this different and this different. And you learn, don't you? You learn a little when you win, you learn a lot when you lose. And that's a fact. I love this quote from Thomas Edison. He was once questioned about the designing of the first light bulb, and here's what he had to say. I have not failed 700 times. I have not failed once. I have succeeded in proving that those 700 ways will not work. <laughs> yeah. When I have eliminated the ways that will not work, I will find the way that will work. I love that. What a great attitude. Can you approach life that way? Can you look at your failures and instead of letting them get you down, go, okay, that's one way not to do it. In my outdoors, I can do that. When I miss a deer, I'm in the stand the next day to make some magic. I got redemption to go. You know, when I'm fishing, I can go after it. But when you feel like you fail in other areas of life, are you willing to find that 700th way to reach out to your wife and mend that marriage? Or to reach out to that son or daughter that you feel like you can't talk to? Are you willing to say, okay, that's another way that does it, but I'm not giving up? Are you willing to learn from your mistakes in life the way we would in the outdoors? Can you work through the 700 ways not to do it until you find the way that works? We learn from our failures, and I think that's the first lesson that God wants to have. I think the second lesson that God wants us to have about our failures, God is trying to get our attention. And here's a verse I want to share with you. This is the next part of the slide. The prophet Haggai is sharing this, this revelation that he's had with the people of Israel. He's talking to them, and here's what he says. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. These people are doing everything right. They're planting, they're you know, dressing. <laughs> They're doing all the things in life and it's not working. Literally, God has his hand against them. And there's a reason. At this time in their lives, they are building up their own personal wealth and properties. And God's temple isn't even a temple, it's a tent. And he says, I want you to pay attention to my house too. And he says, I'm gonna do this to get your attention. Is that sound bizarre that God would literally work against you to get your attention? Don't we do that as parents? I do that as a parent. I will let my son get frustrated doing what he's doing until he's ready to listen to me. Is God any different than that? In my own life, maybe, some, maybe there's an area of sin in our lives that we need to think through. Maybe there's a pride thing. Maybe we need to be humble. In my life, I was Christian, active in my faith to middle school, and when I got to ninth grade, I fell in with the most infamous, troublemaking group of people in school, marching band. <laughs> and if that wasn't bad enough, it was the drum line. I was a concussionist. That's right. That's right, brother man. We started small. We just poured a little beer and a pop. Then it was just, then there was no pop. And then it was five years of drinking. Then I got into breaking into cars, stealing stuff, selling it at the college campuses to make money to buy more alcohol. That was five, that's, I know, that's your guest speaker. <laughs> I know, this is in the Livonia area, so if any of you were missing anything in the late 80s, sorry. Yeah, happens, yeah. I had a rock bottom experience. Literally, I took that lifestyle to a point where I was sick on the floor in a bathroom in my house. My father had to carry me upstairs and dress me. And I was laying in bed saying, I have made a train wreck of my life. And that's when I prayed and I said, God, I've forgotten about you for five years and I have wrecked my life. If you can do anything with this life, it's yours. And my life took an immediate change of direction, led me into youth ministry and into the ministry I'm in now. But God had to let me go to that bottom before I was ready to change. Here's my advice to you, check yourself. If you feel like things are not working out, in addition to what God may be teaching us, check and see, what is your attitude like? Is there an area of sin or something wrong in your life that you need to address? And I'll tell you, you don't need a pastor to tell you what's wrong in your life, you know. 
When you're alone at night, you know what's right and wrong in your life. Deal with those things. Don't leave it in God's hands because he will let you go as low as you have to go to realize that you need him. Realize it soon. Sometimes God is trying to get our attention. Here's the third thing that I think God does with our failures. This is kind of a, this is a cool one. I like this. God is saving us for something better. You apply for a job and you don't get it. You know, you apply for a mortgage for a house and you don't get it. You know, guys, you're looking at that girl going, hey. And she's like, Shh, whatever. And you're like, oh, the woman of my dreams just shot me down. You know, and you're like, oh, that relationship, she was the one. He was the one. And we're just like, oh, so devastated. Can we wrap our brain around the concept God might have something better for us? God's saying, you want soda crackers and I have nine courses of wild game dinner. We want good and God's got awesome for us. One of my favorite verses is in Proverbs. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it says this. Trust God and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That means put him first, and he will make your path straight. Anyone ever walk in a corn maze? Cool. Three of us. That's awesome. Ah, no, there's four. I see. There's not a lot of corn mazes in the Detroit area, I guess, so... Someone said that's called Walmart around here. I don't know. Life-size maze, seven-foot walls, can't see where you're going. You walk in, and your world goes from a giant maze to, do I go left or right? And that's all you can see. And you make your choice, and then you're at the next intersection, going to left or right. And that's all you know. And you bumble your way through fairly blindly, don't you? We've gone to these. This one I went to was about 100 acres. And they had towers. And we climbed a tower, and we're watching people. And I'm like... That dude is walking in a giant spiral that ends in a dead end in the middle. And we're all like, <laughs> and I'm like, should we tell him? And they're like, no. And we're like, oh, you're doing great down there. But we can see from that tower, we can, if you just take a left there, he's on his way. We become the eye in the sky. And I realize that is the best illustration of faith I can think of. You can bumble turn by turn through life on your own, or you can find this kind of relationship with God and allow him to be our eye in the sky. Don't trust what you think you want. Trust what God knows you need. You may want good, but God may have great for you. Perfect example, I was applying for a mortgage on a house. Went and saw the house. I went, oh, this house is perfect. It's in this town south line where I was going to be a youth pastor. I'd been there three years. I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. Buy my first house. We walk down to the basement, and here looks like a giant octopus. It's like this... It's like, so someone knows heating and just went, oh, dang. <laughs> it's this thing that used to burn coal and they converted it. It's got all these tubes going everywhere. I'm like, ah, it looks like that giant sea monster from Little Mermaid. You know, and then they're like, um, we need to talk about your house, Russ. My friends go look at it. I'm like, but I want it. And they went, mmm. A year later, you know what happened? I moved across the state. I'd have been toast financially had I gotten that mortgage and bought a house and sold it a year later? I wanted good, and well, God said, no, no. He says, I can see two turns ahead from you, and I know that you don't need that house right now. Can you trust that? Sometimes God says no to what we want because he knows what's great and what we need. After I miss those deer, we go to the next slide, I'll just leave it there. After I miss that deer, I went to my youth group. So Sunday morning I wake up and I am still sick about the whole thing. I hardly slept. And now I have to teach my youth group. But I had some flowery, beautiful lesson. And I just went, I don't even want to talk to those stupid kids. <sighs> you know, if you're a teacher or a parent or a youth pastor, you know. I went, all right. All I can think about is my failure and disappointment. So guess what the lesson was about? Failure and disappointment. And they talked through these three points. And I told them my miserable story of missing deer. And that sometimes God wants us to learn from our failures. Sometimes he needs to get our attention because of something in our lives. And sometimes he's got something better. And after youth group, I've been at that church for about seven years at the time. I had a couple kids come up to me after and say, you know what? We've never heard you speak about that lesson before. I said, no, I kind of wrote it today. <laughs> and they said, thank you. We really needed to hear that. And I went, really? This is how you, this is how you roll, huh? I got to miss two deer and be sick to my stomach all night so that I, you can get the lesson out of me you want, really? Awesome. 
starting to rethink this whole faith thing, but I'll trust you. Tuesday, I go out in my tree stand. What a zip. I've scared every deer in the county pretty much. Wednesday, nothing. Thursday, Hunter's nod. Nod my head. And at one point, I glance up, and I just see something brown about 200 yards away through all the trees, and I went, oh. I'm, I'm like, Sasquatch. That was like Bigfoot. I'm serious. It was huge. And I'm like, did I even see that? And my heart's pounding a little. I said, okay, don't be stupid. You got caught with your bow across your lap just four days ago. I get my bow ready, get my arrow, and I'm just kind of thinking, and now I'm starting to pay attention to my surroundings. I'm a little more awake, and I notice the wind's coming across this way, and it's kind of heading that way. And, I, you know, I think he's going downwind from me. I'm like, seems to me smarter deer, bigger deer do that. So, okay, keep that in mind. After about 10 minutes, I start to hear footsteps. And I'm watching him through the brush. I can see some legs. Can't see much else. And I'm like, eh, I don't know if it's that big. I mean, it's just legs, the feet, really. And all of a sudden, I get a glance at the body. I'm like, oh. And then he steps out from behind the bush, and it's just antlers everywhere. And I'm like, that is the biggest deer I've ever seen. Towering over the one I missed just 10 yards away four days earlier. And my heart is pounding, but I'm ready. And he stops 20 yards in front of me. And I draw my bow, and then I go, branch. He's standing right where that four point was, and I hit the branch, and I don't shoot, and I wait, and I hold, and he looks around, and I hold for two minutes. You practice that shot, guys? <laughs> practice that shot. I'm holding for two minutes. <laughs> Starting to shake. He takes two steps forward, I go, and I let it go. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> The next Sunday, I show this PowerPoint presentation to my youth group. Is it playing sound? Oh, where's the sound? No sound? Is it not plugged in? Ah. Oh, okay. So what you can't hear is the 2001 Space Odyssey music <laughs> building. So it's the Tiffany's dun 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 dun. Devastating, and this is how it's going, and it's building, the music gets quiet, and the kids are all paying attention, and they're listening, and it's drawing them in, and it talks about this, how he poured out his heart in a passionate lesson to his beloved youth group. I hear it. And lives were touched in the midst of the pain. We're almost there. Can we get a little more volume? Is that coming from the laptop? Okay, it's not plugged in. Okay. The next week, he found the courage to climb into his stand again. After three days and no deer seeing, God answered his cry. He heard footsteps. He drew his bow. He took his shot and went home with this. And my whole youth group just burst into applause and cheers. <laughs> Biggest deer I've ever shot in my life. Eight point symmetrical and now he lives in my living room. <laughs> and, uh, it's not the biggest deer in the world, but for me it's an important deer because it's a deer that reminded me that God lets me miss good to save me for awesome. How do you approach the failures in your life, guys, and disappointment? Can we approach failures in our life the way we do in the outdoors? We would just keep going. We would learn. We would struggle with it, but we keep going. And I want to challenge you tonight. When you experience failure, whether it's outdoors or in real life, as a husband, as a father, as a teacher, I mean, as a student, as a business person, can you stop and look at those failures and go, am I trying, is, is there something I need to learn from this failure? Can you try 700 times until you find the way that works? Can you say, maybe there's something I need to zoom out and check myself, check my attitude, check my lifestyle, and make sure that this is all honoring to God? And can you look and say, maybe God is saying no to good because he wants to say yes to something awesome. Can you approach failure in your life? Let's celebrate failure, guys, because that is how God shapes and molds us into the people he wants us to be. And that's what he's doing in my life, and that's what he's doing in your lives. Awesome. Thank you so much for the chance to be here, guys. Awesome to be here.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I want to say one thing. You guys last year were awesome during the auction. You kept the talk down when you weren't interested in the item that was being bid. I just ask you, you give Steve your best attention. You can talk, keep it down while he's, uh, the bidders are bidding so he can pick up what's going on. Right now, I'm going to have Steve come. We're going to do the live auction and get through that. Steve? Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. Warren Woods has been here the last few years, and thanks to Jim Bell. Uh, don't run away yet, because we're going to give away this. We've only got 10 items to sell. It's going to take me, uh, hopefully, about 20 minutes here. I do have a little bit of a raspy voice, because I did have a messy tail in the cold, so we will get through it. All these items here, these door prizes, will be given away as soon as we're done with the live auction. If you want to bid on anything and you haven't been to an auction before, just put your hand in the air. We do have some spotters out here in the crowd. They will see you, and they will come to your table once you begin bidding. Once you become the buyer of any of the merchandise we're going to sell tonight, you can pay for it back in the uh, in the back uh, uh, hallway where the cashiers were from the silent auction. Someone will come to your table with a sheet so you can fill it out for the items that you did buy. If you have any questions, stop me. Now, if you if you want to bid, it's hard for me to see this whole crowd. I don't want to miss any bids. If, if you uh, can't uh, can't seem to get my attention, pinch your neighbor, make them squeal. Uh, don't be bad, but it's an auction. Uh, we got some really good items to go through here tonight, so we'll get through just as fast as we can. My All right, well, you see you time, couldn't handle this I whole thing, so I'll take the front half. Okay. okay, I'm ready. If you're ready, check. Are you ready to go? Where are my spotters? There we are. If you can't get my attention, get their attention. And that way we will get to uh, get to in the midst of the bidding. Okay, first item that we have up here tonight, number one, is a pheasant hunting uh, uh, gift certificate. This is from Pheasant Ridge Hunt Club. It entitles a successful bidder to a four bird hunt. Dogs and a dog handler may be arranged as an additional charge. Bird cleaning is also available. And you just need to provide your own license, gun, and ammunition. And it has a seventy-four dollar value. Okay, on that pheasant hunting trip there, how about a hundred out? Hundred way or a bit of hundred? How about fifty? Fifty way, but fifty dollar, fifty way. Who would have been buying? Would have been fifty dollar, fifty. Give me twenty-five to start me. Twenty-five. Who wants to do some pheasant hunting? Twenty-five. Who would have been buying? Would have been twenty-five to do some pheasant hunting over Pheasant Ridge. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Good place to start. Who would have been Would have been twenty-five. Twenty-five. We're at twenty-five and now thirty. Thirty where? Would have been thirty. Would have been thirty dollar. Thirty where? Would have been thirty to do the pheasant hunt. Thirty dollars, thirty way, would it be thirty? Would it be thirty dollars? Would it be thirty? Seventy-five dollar value. Thirty dollars, thirty way, would it be thirty? Would it be thirty dollars? Thirty here now five. Thirty-five, would it be thirty-five? Thirty-five here, would it be thirty-five? Thirty-five, would it be thirty-five? Thirty. Thirty. Okay. Thirty-five would be thirty-five. Would it be thirty-five? We got thirty there. Would it be thirty-five? That's for thirty-five dollars. All in, all done. Thirty-five dollars. Over thirty, right here. Thank you. Just let me know when we're ready to go hunting. I'll be glad to go. Of course, I live in Bat, actually. You'll have to drive just a little ways. You know, it's kind of funny. Yesterday, we uh, uh, left uh, yesterday afternoon to come up here, but yesterday was the first day this year that I had to have a snowplow truck come come plow my driveway. We hadn't had any snow all winter long, and yesterday morning, we had about three inches of uh, real heavy, slushy snow, and I had to have my driveway clean. Got down here. You folks are living right through it. no snow down here. Okay, number two, we have a bowling party, and this is a gift certificate from Continental Lanes, and it entitles the bear and up to 15 guests, three games of bowling and free two rental. And let's book it in advance at the $200 value, so if you want to go do a little bit of bowling, great way to have a party. Hey, on that $200 bowling party there, how about $100? Uh, $100, but a 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 $100, Sixty dollars would have been sixty would have been sixty. I've got fifty here. Would have been sixty would have been sixty would have been sixty. Sixty dollars would have been sixty. I'm going to sixty dollars would have been sixty dollars would have been sixty. Five hundred dollars. Sixty dollars. 
$60. Anybody else? That it? Nobody else holds around here? $60. I sold it for $50 right back there. Thank you very much. I do have one more of those if anybody wants it for the same amount of money. Anybody else want another one of those bowling uh, excursions for $50? Right here. That gentleman right there will take the second one. Thank you. Okay, the third thing that I have.